New Brunswick's Bay of Fundy coastline. A journey along one of the world's most famed waterways. From the incredible contours of Fundy Trail to the sea caves and mud flats among the world's highest tides. The coastlines here have it all. Stunning geological formations on this world famous inlet. I've had people come and cry and be moved, literally moved to tears because it was the first time they felt that they were actually connected with nature. An inland river system featuring the world's longest covered bridges. Now yeah, the tourists just love it. The biggest phrase that they always say is quite a bridge. And the history kind of makes it more appealing. And a revolutionary approach to fish farming on the shores of Fundy. As a matter of fact, with all three types of organisms, we are one of the few places in the world doing it. Now, we explore this rugged coastline like never before. A bird's eye view, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. This is Canada, over the edge. From the shores of nearby Nova Scotia, the Bay of Fundy coastline extends more than 500 kilometers. From the sheltered mudflats of the Minas Basin to Canada's international boundary with the United States. Advocate Harbor is our first stop. Home to more than 800 people, the community is famous for its sheltered harbor and for the unique driftwood lining these endless beaches. Following the rocky shore to its natural end, pebbles and stones are replaced by coastal cliffs rising high into the sky. It is a familiar sight along a spectacular coastline, carved from volcanic rock over millions of years. Inland, a 24-kilometer strip of land called the Isthmus of Chignecto connects the provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It is a boundary that was fought over centuries ago. 
battles now immortalized by the ruins of this formidable defense complex. Constructed in 1751, Fort Beauséjour was a French stronghold separating England's New World territories from French Acadia. In 1755, the French were defeated and the star-shaped enclosure was renamed Fort Cumberland. Fort Cumberland would defend English interests in the region for more than 50 years, from hostile rebels during the American Revolution and again in the War of 1812. Continuing northwest, the city of Moncton lies below. This region was settled by French Acadians as early as the 1670s, but received its name from English Lieutenant Colonel Robert Moncton who would defeat French forces at Fort Beauséjour a century later. Today, the city represents the cultural mix of the region as one of Canada's most bilingual and fastest growing cities. Moncton lies at the geographic center of the Maritime Provinces and is known as the Hub. Today, on the outskirts, high above, a helicopter patrols New Brunswick's nearly 7,000 kilometers of power lines a crucial job in a region with vast expanses of inland wilderness. Far below, Moncton's Petticodiac River is the starting point for a journey along New Brunswick's Fundy Coast. This winding body of water empties a watershed of more than 2,000 square kilometers on its path to the Bay of Fundy. With a strong tidal bore carrying loads of sediment, the brown tint has earned Petticodiac the nickname Chocolate River. Now at the entrance to Fundy, we continue southwest, exploring the incredible geological monuments on New Brunswick's Bay of Fundy coast. From Moncton, New Brunswick, along the shores of the Petticodiac River, our aerial survey changes course, 
following the rocky contours of New Brunswick's Bay of Fundy coastline. Entrance to the bay sits New Brunswick's postcard image. This is Hopewell Rocks, a unique set of stone structures, their beauty fully revealed at low tide. On any given summer day, this shoreline is packed with visitors eager to see these seaside formations. Guide Anna Marie Weir has been bringing visitors to this spot for nearly a decade. Right now we're at the Hopewell Rocks in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, along the upper reaches of the Bay of Fundy. Uh, the Bay of Fundy extends about 290 kilometers or 180 miles long. So we're in the upper reaches of the bay, uh, what we call Hopewell Rocks. The Hopewell Rocks, also known as the Flower Pot Rocks, or simply the Rocks, have been carved from the world's highest tides. A geographical phenomenon with a legend dating back thousands of years. Well, the first people to this area, as in all of North America, of course, were First Nation people, and specific to this exact area with the Mi'kmaq. So uh, when we talk about the highest tides in the world here at the Bay of Fundy, uh, the Mi'kmaq legend uh, as to the cause of this goes that the, the great uh, native god, Blueskap, wanted to take a bath one day. Uh, so he asked the beaver to create a dam across uh, where the mouth of the Bay of Fundy is. So the beaver did as he was asked, but the whale got very, very upset and wanted to know what the heck was stopping the water coming in and out all of a sudden. So because Glooscap didn't want to offend the whale, he asked the beaver to release the waters from the dam, but the whale was too impatient and ended up sloshing his tail back and forth against the, the dam until it broke. And, and thus we have that same sloshing back motion again today, creating the highest tides in the world. And that's the Mi'kmaq legend. Thousands of years later, the rocks continue to inspire visitors on these shores. It's such a very, very special spot here at Hopewell Rocks for so many, many reasons. Number one, of course, being that you have the opportunity. We have the highest tides in the world here in the Bay of Fundy. And here at Hopewell Rocks, you'll see a fluctuation of the tide height anywhere uh, from 10 to 14 meters, you know. So that's anywhere from 33 up to 46 feet. Uh, so literally you come, you walk on the ocean floor at low tide and you can return six hours and 13 minutes later for the opposing tide and see that the area that you've walked in is now completely immersed and covered in water. One of the very few places in the world where you can experience actually walking around rock formations and, and seeing that, that tide come in and covering up the rock formation that you've walked around. I've had people here from all over the world, and when I say all over the world, I truly mean all over the world. Uh, I've had people come and cry and be moved, literally moved to tears because it was the first time they felt that they were actually connected with nature. And when you look at these geological rock formations, you know, these date back to almost 330 million years ago. So when you're on the ocean floor and you're touching these rocks and you're looking at them and you're realizing that this is a major piece of history and it's a beacon for us in the tourism industry and uh, it's just an absolutely amazing place to come and, and visit. From Hopewell, we continue along the Bay of Fundy at low tide. With tides dropping as much as 17 meters, all that remains of this waterway are trickling streams and incredible mudflats stretching for miles.
It is a landscape that has earned the Bay of Fundy a spot as finalist in a worldwide competition to name the new seven wonders of the natural world. To the west, Barn Marsh Island runs six kilometers, separated from the mainland by a narrow channel. On the ocean side, at the base of Barn Marsh's spectacular cliffs, one of the region's top beaches runs the entire length of the island. And high above these 40-meter cliffs, explorers from all over congregate to tackle these challenging rock faces. Now at the tip of Barn Marsh Island sits another Fundy Wonder. This is Cape and Rage. Dividing the waters of Chignecto Bay from the Bay of Fundy. Named Cap Enrangé by early Acadian settlers, Dangerous currents surrounding the Cape make navigation here treacherous. High above the 50-meter plateau, a light station and fog alarm has served mariners since 1838. It is the site of the oldest lighthouse on mainland New Brunswick, more than 150 years old. Today, this lookout point is considered one of the best seaside views in Eastern Canada. Less than 10 kilometers to the west lies the village of Alma. Home to just over 300 residents, Alma is famous for views of its fishing fleet at low tide. Set on a river delta emptying into Salisbury Bay, it also marks the entrance to the incredible Fundy National Park.
Covering more than 200 square kilometers of coastal land and highland Acadian forests, Fundy Park is one of the last untouched stretches of wilderness on this coast. This is where New Brunswick's Caledonia Highlands descend to the tidal shores of Fundy. With the rhythm of the bay shrouding the treetops in an eerie mist. With more than 100 kilometers of hiking and biking trails, Fundy Park is one of the province's top attractions. From Fundy Park, this incredible shoreline continues southwest along Fundy's world-famous roadway and the incredible sea caves and covered bridges of St. Martin's. From Hopewell Rocks to Fundy National Park, the New Brunswick coastline is a mix of haunting wilderness and stunning geological formations. Continuing southwest, Fundy National Park leads to the Fundy Footpath and Fundy Trail. Here, 41 kilometers of hiking trails carved out of the Fundy Escarpment line one of the last coastal wilderness areas between Labrador and Florida. A four-day trek here offers explorers spectacular vistas, towering cliffs and waterfalls, a true Bay of Fundy eco-experience up close and personal. Along the Fundy Trail, 13 kilometers of paved parkway, 16 kilometers of bicycle routes, and more world-class hiking trails offer a glimpse of this unique region of the world. Part of the Upper Bay of Fundy UNESCO Biosphere, this stretch of Fundy Coast is one of 500 around the world. Recognized by the United Nations for its incredible natural beauty.
At the western limits to the trail lies one of Fundy's picturesque settlements, the village of St. Martin's. A native Mi'kmaq settlement for centuries, a group of loyalist soldiers known as the King's Orange Rangers arrived in 1783. beginning a strong loyalist tradition along this coast. For decades, St. Martin's was a shipbuilding hub. Seeing the construction and launch of more than 500 ships at sea. Today, it is considered one of the region's top destinations, boasting lighthouses, covered bridges, salt marshes, and spectacular Red Sea caverns. Further west, on the outskirts of the city of St. John, the airport connects the city to points west and beyond. St. John is the largest city in New Brunswick, an industrial hub home to more than 125,000 people. This coastal region had been occupied by the Passamaquoddy First Nation for thousands of years. When French cartographer Samuel de Champlain first spotted the sheltered harbor back in 1604. The city would change hands between the French and English until the end of the 18th century, when the settlements of Parrtown and Carlton would merge to form St. John, the first incorporated city in British North America. Under constant threat during the American Revolution from advancing forces just 50 kilometers away, St. John became a haven for loyalists to the British crown. Far below, the Carlton Martello Tower is one of the legacies of this wartime history. Constructed for the War of 1812, the tower would serve the city up until World War II when guns were installed in the upper level of the tower to defend the city from German U-boat attacks. But an aerial survey of St. John would not be complete without a geological exploration of the region. Next, we look at iconic reversing falls and the Bay of Fundy's role in the formation of the world as we know it today. High above the loyalist city of St. John, and one of the East Coast's major industrial centers.
For decades, St. John has been a manufacturing hub, employing thousands in the factories and pulp mills along the city's riverfront. And it is here, where the waters of the St. John River meet the Bay of Fundy, that a natural phenomenon is created. One that has attracted the attention of visitors and scientists for centuries. We're standing under the Reversing Falls Bridge, which crosses the gorge at the Reversing Falls in, in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, this is where the St. John River, which flows all the way down New Brunswick, empties into the Bay of Fundy. The reversing falls, or the reversing rapids as we, we tend to call it now, is a phenomenon of, uh, based around the tides and the high tides in the Bay of Fundy. Uh, we know that we have the highest tidal range in the world here. In, in St. John, it's about eight meters. So when the, when the tide rises, it actually pushes the St. John River backwards. And uh, that, I mean, that's the basis for the, for the tourist attraction, really, is the reversing of, of this mighty river that's come all the way down from the north of New Brunswick. But for Randall Miller, there is a greater geological mystery. While reversing falls is a phenomenon just a few thousand years old, the rocks surrounding the falls tell a much more ancient tale. So the rocks on one side of us where we're standing are a billion years old. The rocks on just behind me are about 500 million years old. We're actually standing on a fault line that separates the two. And the rocks to the north of us, the billion-year-old rocks, were once part of probably South America. The rocks behind me, the Avalon rocks, were once part of what we now think of as Africa. And they split off those continents, migrated across the globe, and have attached themselves to, to ancient North America. So here we are looking at a story of, of rocks that have migrated halfway across the Earth and ended up here. It is a location unique in the world and one that Miller hopes to showcase with the formation of a larger geological park. We've just created what's called Stonehammer Geopark uh, here in the, in the southern New Brunswick area around St. John, and that's really to look at the geological stories as, as part of a, a global geoparks network, and we're actually looking at the reversing rapids as the center of the story. It has some of the oldest rocks in New Brunswick. It has a great story of plate tectonics. It has this ice age story of, of how this river formed and the reversing of the rapids and that tidal story of the Bay of Fundy. It really wraps together a, a, a fairly major story of, of the East Coast. And of course, the rivers on the East Coast of, of Canada are pretty spectacular. Beyond St. John, wilderness returns. Just southwest of the city, the Irving Nature Park covers 243 hectares of coastline. It is one of the province's richest marine ecosystems. With beaches, woodlands, and salt marshes, all built on the volcanic rock coastline of the Bay of Fundy. The park is a stopping ground for migratory birds, traveling between the Arctic and South America. More than 250 species have been recorded here, along the 20 kilometers of hiking trails, just minutes from downtown. Twenty kilometers further sits the Musquash Estuary. Located where the Musquash River meets the Bay of Fundy, a study decades ago revealed that Musquash is Fundy's only fully functioning estuary. Trapping nutrients carried by rivers and tides, estuaries foster an incredible amount of animal and plant life. They are key to a coastline survival. And Musquash is no exception. An incredible stretch of coast containing cobble and sand beaches, mudflats, salt marshes, rocky headlands, 
coastal forests and islands. The area is home to all types of wildlife, and its two nature trails allow visitors to experience the serenity of this remote coastline. continuing as the American border lies in the distance. And here, in the outpost of St. George, tidal conditions and sheltered waters allow for one of the region's most intriguing fishing operations along this coast. Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, or IMTA, integrate salmon farming with other plants and animals lower on the food chain. It's an attempt to reduce waste and cultivate multiple species in the same location. Frank Powell of Cook Aquaculture and Dr. Thierry Chopin of the University of New Brunswick are part of the operation here. What we do is what we call integrated multitrophic aquaculture. So instead of having just monoculture of fish to, to the fish, we add the seaweeds and the mussels. And really it's to do a, a balanced uh, ecosystem approach to aquaculture, where we have the fish that we feed, and then you have the seaweed and the shellfish that extract from the seawater. So all together, they balance each other all the extra food and all the nutrients are recaptured. And as a matter of fact, instead of having just one crop, the, the salmon, you get at least three crops. You get the salmon, the seaweed, and the mussels. While the operation at St. George is cutting edge, the idea of IMTA goes back hundreds of years. The ones that did it first, uh, centuries ago was the Chinese and the Japanese. But now we are doing it in a more scientific aspect. Uh, and as a matter of fact, with all three type of organisms, we are one of the few places in the world doing it. Frank Powell has worked with Cook Aquaculture for nearly a decade. With 50% of the world's seafood now farmed, he sees IMTA as the future. Uh, the practices we do on all our other farms are quite good right now as well. But this is just another way, of course, with any farm, there's going to be some nutrients escaping, so this is another way of actually soaking up those extra nutrients and, and producing a couple extra crops. Um, we're just getting to a point right now where it's, I won't call it commercial yet, but we're almost there. Following the path of the region's tidal flow, salmon, mussel, and seaweed farms are placed in a row, with the mussels using organic waste from the salmon, and the seaweed retrieving waste the mussels leave behind. Here it's one of our uh, seaweed lines. It's a seaweed raft. So the, the seaweeds are downstream to get the inorganic, like uh, dissolved nitrogen, dissolved phosphorus, and then you have the mussels on the, the salmon. Further upstream, the mussel cages contain as many as 60,000 pounds of mussels. These mussel cages are next to the salmon and then the kelp cage is a little further away. So these will take up a lot of the, the bigger particles from the salmon farm. When you're feeding salmon, you're, you're always going to have a percentage of what you call fines, which are like dusty material that the salmon won't eat. So that'll pass through the farm. Mussels grown air compared to a reference site probably grow about 30% uh, faster. And their meat yields are actually about 30% higher as well. So. Finally, salmon cages mark the beginning of this chain, an experiment whose idea dates back centuries and may now change the seafood industry forever.
From the American border, we return northeast to the city of St. John, heading inland and exploring the fantastic wonders of the St. John River. From high above the city of St. John, Reversing Falls Bridge marks the spot where the Bay of Fundy meets one of the East Coast's most spectacular rivers. When Samuel de Champlain recorded the first European landing here in 1604, the date was June 24th. The Feast of St. John the Baptist, giving the St. John River and the city a title that lives on more than four centuries later. Extending more than 600 kilometers inland and draining an area of more than 55,000 square kilometers, the St. John is the second longest river between the St. Lawrence and the Mississippi on the eastern seaboard. For centuries, it has served many purposes. Transportation, hydroelectric power, agriculture, and part of Canada's political boundary with the American state of Maine. Today, it's known as the Rhine of North America, one of the region's top spots for recreational boating. It's sheltered inland waters, perfect for lazy summertime cruises. Further north, the wilderness of the river is spectacular. Here, Spoon Island rises from the riverbed. A home to plant life and wildlife far from civilization. Further still, one of the river's signature features, covered bridges. Here in Heartland, this small town boasts the world's longest covered bridge, more than 1,000 feet long. We're here in Heartland, New Brunswick, the home of the longest covered bridge in the world that crosses the St. John River. The thing about the bridge, it is 1,282 feet. And what it actually is, is seven bridges together. It's a PAL truss uh, construction. So seven small bridges are, are put together on six piers and two abutments. The covered bridge tradition here began as a way to connect river communities that were separated for most of the year. In the, the days when there wasn't a bridge, the farmers on the other side would have a horse and a wagon. They didn't have a lot of gravel. It was just a really rough, bumpy ride all the way to Woodstock, which would probably be a full day's ride. 
they would put their produce on the uh, railroad and then have to all come all the way back, which is very difficult knowing that you could just look across and see the other railroad across the river. Heartland's bridge began as a restoration and almost happened by accident. Finally, they decided that they would restore it. And at the time, they, the town people really wanted to have a steel bridge, but it was too expensive. And the government wouldn't say yes. So they uh, repaired it, and then they decided to cover it then. So it was 1920 when it was really actually covered. This was a big controversy in the town because they really didn't want it covered. As you can imagine, it's, it's a long tunnel. And this is where local people used to go in, after church for socials and stuff. They wanted a bridge, they just didn't want it covered. More than a century later, it is a tradition that has become an iconic image of New Brunswick. Well, I don't know what it is about a covered bridge, but it's, a, it's kind of a home feeling. It was a center of a community. And really, the bridge has been here for so long, it's almost like it has human characteristics. You refer to it quite often. So I think covered bridges has that stigma to it. Like everything else, you kind of take things for granted. Now the tourists just love it. You know, the biggest phrase that they always say is quite a bridge. And the history kind of makes it more appealing. More than 50 kilometers upriver from St. John and the waters of the Bay of Fundy, the city of Fredericton appears on the horizon. Built on the banks of the river centuries ago, Fredericton is a military town a university town, and the provincial capital, home to more than 80,000 people. And it marks the end of a chapter in this exploration of Canada's eastern coastlines. from the endless mudflats to rich coastal parkland. The Bay of Fundy continues to inspire residents and visitors from around the world. With its world famous tides, an incredible geological legacy, it remains one of the world's natural wonders, here on the edge of Canada.